there is a royalty that you can set. You don't have to set a royalty, but a lot of people are setting a royalty of 10%. So if I sell it, there's an artist resell, right? And this has been, you know, people have tried to do this offline. It's very hard to track, right? How do I know if you've sold my painting or something? You know, right. you have to track me down or they have to be honest, right? Mm -hmm. And they, not everyone's honest. And so a lot of people have um, tried to make the artist resale a human right. And there's been a lot of work to to bring conventions around this in Switzerland. And this, this is just the ethos within NFTs that most people are automatically ascribing a uh you know a resale right and so there's a lot of different mechanics you can play with there around scarcity around uh, breaking in your early fans uh mm -hmm. or even your late fans into what could be a um you know really scarce digital digital uh collectible what's going on welcome to the new music business i'm your host ari herstand author of how to make it in the new music business the book Today, we are continuing on our NFT journey, and my guest is Joe Conyers, who is the executive vice president uh, and global head of NFTs at Crypto.com. Now, for those of you who follow insider baseball in the music industry, you know Joe Conyers as the co-founder of Song Trust, the largest admin music publisher out there collecting songwriter royalties for independent songwriters. Now, Song Trust is owned by Downtown Music Holdings. Most of you know it as Downtown Publishing. And Downtown, when Joe kind of rose through the ranks and he was the chief strategy officer at Downtown, they acquired and purchased CD Baby. He's been in the industry. He's been around. And, and uh, he was named a digital power player by Billboard magazine four years in a row. So now Joe has hopped on over to Crypto.com and is in the NFT space. Now, they just launched, so they're one of these newer marketplaces, and in their first seven drops, they made over $6.5 million in sales. Now, Snoop Dogg was part of one of those drops, so he helped a bit in that, but they've also done over seven figures in secondary sales. That's when... Uh, you buy an NFT, that's a primary sale if you buy it directly from the owner. And then if you resell it, that's a thing with NFTs, you can always resell it for whatever you want. And the beautiful thing about NFTs, which Joe goes into more detail in our interview, is the original artist gets paid a percentage typically on every resell. That's what's so great and can be so great about NFTs. But the real headline making news of this interview is that Crypto.com hosts all their NFTs on a much more environmentally friendly blockchain. It is not the Ethereum blockchain. Most NFTs these days are hosted on the Ethereum blockchain, and the Ethereum blockchain is insanely energy inefficient. It is a massive strain on the environment. A lot of artists have chosen not to do NFTs solely for this reason, because the amount of energy it takes to power just one NFT through that sale and through the subsequent sales and just the NFT marketplace is more energy than small countries, more energies than it takes to power your studio for a couple of years. Now, that's uh, we get into why this is in a little bit later in our interview. Hopefully, this will change soon, but Crypto.com is not on Ethereum. Crypto.com is on a different blockchain, which Joe discusses in, in our interview. Very fascinating stuff. He also breaks down some of the cool NFTs that uh, they have worked on. Uh, very creative stuff going on in the space. As always, please follow, subscribe, like this podcast. However you're listening to this right now, give us a subscribe. Give us a follow. Leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. That really helps. And if you're listening on YouTube right now, pop a comment in there. And if you ask a question, I will try to answer it or someone from my team or we'll go ask Joe. We'll try to get your question answered. You can find all of us on Instagram, TikTok, or Twitter at Ari's Take. You can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Ari Herstand. And of course, visit Ari's Take .com. Sign up on that email list. That's where you'd be kept up to date with all things happening in the new music business. All right, let's kick into the show. Joe Conyers, welcome to the show. Uh, great to be here, Ari. Thanks for having yeah, me. Yeah, appreciate it. Total, absolutely. I mean, this is um, 
this is fun because I've only known you well as a song trust guy. And, uh, yeah, you right. know, like throughout the years, I mean, uh, you have been the song trust man. And, and like, I have been a big fan of song trust through the years. I, I mean, you're the co-founder, I guess, of song. Yeah. Trust, right? Yeah. And you know, I, I definitely passed the torch to Molly Newman a couple of years yep. ago and, and I stepped over to really just focus yeah. on the overall downtown business as mm -hmm. chief strategy officer. And, um, you know, they've just been on fantastic tear and it's been a great mm -hmm. uh, run they're on. And so yeah. um, it happened to be that, uh, you know, Justin, my co-founder's brother, was the CMO of Crypto.com. So somehow he blackmailed him to letting me move out. But it felt <laughs> like, you know, new all-time yeah. highs. So it was... Uh, yeah. I was going to ask about that because I was reading a Crypto.com, a Medium article uh, by Steve Kalifowitz. And I'm like, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I know that Kalifowitz name. And I'm like, I think there's a Justin Kalifowitz. And I, I was going to like, I was going to impress you. Or I was hoping to impress you with my, with my research abilities and my detective work and be like, there's got to be some kind of connection here between the Kalifowitzes and you were at downtown and Justin is the CEO of downtown, but you, you broke the news for me. And so I don't get to impress anybody with my detective work. Anyway, uh, that is what we're here to talk about today is crypto.com because, um, you know, NFTs have really exploded in the music industry over the last couple months. Um, and, you know, previously, uh, I spoke with Verite, uh, the incredibly talented artist, yeah. independent artist Verite, who she's done a few uh, successful NFT drops on her own. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm jumping into this NFT world. And uh, I think it's very fascinating. I really appreciate how this is potentially a way that uh, value can be kind of brought back to music um and and you know streaming has essentially devalued recorded music or at least what the consumer feels is how you know their access to it but we're seeing really interesting shifts here but i want to kind of step back and do a zoom out because now as the executive vice president slash uh global head of i already forgot your oh yeah no i got it right global head of it, nft all right good i'm like there's so many titles here global head of 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 nft you're the global head of nft of crypto.com please explain to the music community at large like we're five-year-olds like we don't sure. know anything about anything what are nfts and why should we care for a long time, there's been ways to sell people art, and there's been ways to sell people music. And um, for a long time, you you sold something one time, and you said to them, "Here's your receipt, and thank you very much." And they went on with their way. And when digital music became purchasable, you know, it eventually went through a store. I mean, CD Baby, you could sell yourself a digital download. It really started as CD. And so at first, you sell your CD, and then eventually, you'd sell a download store. And um, now there's a whole new way, which has a really interesting twist. You can you can see the provenance of when you bought something. So one of the coolest parts I think about NFTs, non fungible tokens. Who, for those who don't know the acronym, let's um, pause there for a second. Uh, what is a fungible token? If so, NFT is a non fungible token, yeah, fungible tokens are other cryptocurrencies that are an example for our fungible things that are they're all the same, right? One Bitcoin is the same as another Bitcoin. Fungible means that they're interchangeable. Uh, yeah, I give exactly. you a Bitcoin, you give me a Bitcoin. It doesn't really matter which uh, Bitcoin I hold. All Bitcoin are the same. All dollar bills are the same. I can give you $1, it's fungible. You can give me a dollar back, it's all the same. Non-fungible, I'm assuming, means it's not the same. I can't give you, uh, I can't, I can't hand you uh, the Mona Lisa and you can hand me back a print of the Mona Lisa and it's and it's the same thing. Exactly. Right? <laughs> yeah. So it's all about that uniqueness and, and the attribute of that. And so you can addition them and they'll have different editions of this non fungibility. But there are, you know, there's going to be this notion that it is apples to oranges, not apples okay. to apples. Got it. Okay, so let's keep going. So so uh, we have these these non fungible tokens, NFTs. Um, and yeah, how are they relating to music right now? Yeah, so we've seen a lot of people do different things. Uh, most of them tend to be with a mixed media art project, meaning you're going to have a piece of music uh, next to a, a you know visual piece of art. Tend to be an animated okay. piece of art. Um, okay. There are some people who are just selling their their original music as an NFT. 
mm-hmm. but I think the most compelling projects today are those that have some sort of uh, you know moving graphics, animation, 3D effects um, that really show and tell a story. And that, that this is mm-hmm. where it's getting really interesting for me. And part of the reason why I saw this as, you know, this is not a fad. This is the next you know, decades and decades of art. It's the mm-hmm. way a way. It's not going to be the end all, but a way to tell your story as a creator. Um, whether you're an artist, whether you're a visual artist, a musician, um, even a songwriter, you know, there's going to be all sorts of ways people do different things with this medium. Um, mm. And there's different ways to tie in uh, NFTs, right? You don't have to just do it one way. There's already been things on our platform that I think are already starting to push the boundaries of what an NFT could be and what they they are. Mm-hmm. I'm happy to get at that in a minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, and I want to hear these examples. And I've, I've looked at a few because I was browsing the marketplace of crypto.com a little bit before our chat today. Um, but just, just to stay basic for a minute, just so we have a, a strong foundation and understanding of what we're talking about here. So you're saying the most popular NFTs in music right now currently, and obviously, this is probably going to evolve and shift little short little um, videos i guess so that so the file itself we're talking like an mp4 it's just like a video file there's usually maybe some music underneath it uh length duration is this like a full song length or does it vary or people are doing all sorts of things you know we have uh some folks who are doing kind of doing a ep uh there's some folks who are doing uh like a little little short length some 15 second clips um, some folks who've actually broken uh, their songs up into different parts. And so if you oh. add up all the constituent parts, you get the whole song. I mm-hmm. thought that was really fun. Um, I'm working cool. on some really interesting ones where they, um, hopefully I won't, it'll, I won't spoil it, but they, you know, every single one will almost blends into each other on each, each oh, NFT. Cool. So. so if you could theoretically like put them in a display, either a visual or an audio display, and you get the complete you can swipe story the, through them, and you can it just keeps going. It feels like it's one song, even though they're all different songs. Got it. Oh, cool. So, so um, I, I want to get into more of these examples in a, in a minute because this is so fascinating to me. But uh, to break it down even further, because I, I still yeah. want to just get a full understanding of this here. Why are some of these video clips and little, you know, and songs and stuff like that? Why are people paying tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars for something that I could literally watch for free on YouTube or listen for free on Spotify? Yeah. And you could totally just right click save as if you wanted to, too, right? It yeah. is totally, <laughs> you, to can, you can have it and it's yours. Yep. What the, the difference now is, is that you're actually able to prove that I bought it from you. And what does that really mean? Well, it doesn't mean that much today, right? What it means is that you have a record of that transaction. But if you play the tape out to the future, and you're already mm-hmm. seeing lots of experiments happening this, where there is a, a notion of ownership and there are authenticated places to uh, show off that ownership or to uh, get special features for that ownership. So for example, imagine you have an NFT today, you buy a little video of maybe it's Ari's art and you, you mm-hmm. partner with someone else, or maybe, I don't know, maybe you sketch on your side and you've made a little sketch. Yeah. Um, you could hang it in a digital museum, but only you could do that because only in that digital museum are NFTs that are purchased through an official uh, you know, way that shows that you have per- be- been the purchase who purchased it you can actually show it off. So, you know, you could probably have your own um, uh, digital world, right? That only you can play in. And in the same way that I could buy a fake Rolex and I can go mm-hmm. to, you know, the country club and show my friends. But realistically, you know, if you go to the country club, you probably have a real Rolex. And But at this way, you really know that because you're playing in this specific um, digital metaverse or, you know, game or something, that it's real. And you're going to see this go across not just um, these really kind of, very specific UK cases today, but you're going to mm-hmm. see it where like you could imagine your dating profile will have images uh, of the, th- the NFTs you've already bought. Imagine this Zoom, right? Imagine right. there was a special scarf or a special hat that Whoa. only if I bought it from an official store, maybe it's an Hermes scarf or a Supreme hat or something, <laughs> that it is the official thing and you know it's real. You're like, oh, because it's the, the official app. And, and so... The, the way to prevent counterfeiting um, yeah. is really fascinating in the digital world here, right? Sure. And these are just early examples. People are going to come up with all sorts of things. Before we get into counterfeiting, because just to clarify here, so if I'm understanding this correctly, uh, it's like, just go back to the Mona Lisa example I was using before. 
Uh, the Mona Lisa in the Louvre. We know that that is the original Mona Lisa because we trust the Louvre Museum in Paris to authentic museum. Now, what you're talking about is there in the future will be digital museums or digital universes, uh, worlds that uh, they're going to have their own authentication, um, I guess, reputation. So you know that all of the digital works in their space will be authenticated, that it is the original or one of the owners of the original NFT. Is Am I understanding this correctly? Yeah, and it, but it, it may be even simpler than that, right? Okay. Imagine Apple comes out with glasses and you walk into my house and it says, do you want to connect to Joe's uh, gallery? And you'll say yes. And over here on the wall will be one of my NFTs and it will be authentic because you know it'll be the official you know, gallery app that we both know is oh. legit. And so we know if you bought this thing, it's going to be from a verified creator, right? It'll have a little check mark even. You could think about that. Mm -hmm. And um, so there's going to be these layers of authenticity and, and um, provenance across mm -hmm. all of this, which makes it really, really fascinating to play with um, rarity, right? And mm -hmm. additions and sizing and, and how big you are going to let all these, uh, these very unique assets out there um, mm -hmm. and what these things might provide you. Maybe if you have enough, a couple of different NFTs of a musician, it maybe gets you access to do something in real life or digital mm. space. Maybe you get a free VIP ticket. Maybe. Well, we saw um, that with the Kings of Leon. Maybe it's uh, just bragging rights though, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. We saw that with the Kings of Leon yeah, so be, drop where they offered lifetime access, lifetime front row tickets access if you purchase the NFT. But to even break it down further, so I love the additional perks. I totally understand the bragging rights because it's like it's a collectible. At the end of the day, essentially, it is a collectible, just like you were talking about, you know, and, and it's bragging rights. It's that status symbol, like the Rolex watch you mentioned earlier. I mean, it's like, yeah. What's on your wall right now? You've got a bunch of probably very limited edition vinyl is my guess on the back there. <laughs> or maybe it's stuff you just sure. like that you is the second copy and you've got the real one in the back yep. in the glass can you know right. <laughs> container. Yep. Because you really don't want that on the wall. But right. and that you, you can think of that the same way, right? But the real mm -hmm. difference here, and there's there's another big mechanic that I think is is really challenging for artists and both visual artists and musicians to understand, wrap their head around in, in mm -hmm. for a little while. It takes a little couple seconds to think about, which is now in this in this world, when I sell, not the first sale, but the secondary sale, the first sale being the primary sale, the secondary sale mm -hmm. being after, maybe I buy it from you and then I sell it to someone else, right? Mm -hmm. There is a royalty that you can set. You don't have to set a royalty, but a lot of people are setting a royalty of 10%. So if I sell it, there's an artist resale, right? And this has been, you know, people have tried to do this offline. It's very hard to track, right? How do I know if you've sold my painting or something? You know, right. you have to track me down or they have to be honest, right? Mm -hmm. And they, not everyone's honest. And so a lot of people have um, tried to make the artist resale a human right. And there's been a lot of work to to bring conventions around this in Switzerland. And this, this is just the ethos within NFTs that most people are automatically ascribing a uh you know a resale right and so there's a lot of different mechanics you can play with there around scarcity around uh, breaking in your early fans uh mm -hmm. or even your late fans into what could be a um you know really scarce digital digital uh collectible so if i understand the resale uh concept correctly uh some i sell one of my records at a show somebody buys my vinyl record for twenty dollars um, they aren't really interested in it anymore for whatever reason they're moving. They don't want to haul crates of vinyl anymore to the new place. They go to Amoeba Records. They're like, hey, I got the new Ari Herstand record. Amoeba's like, all right, you know what? I'll give you uh, 25 bucks for it. This is pretty rare. So it's like, all right, sweet. They just made a profit of $5. Now, now uh, let's say this one I blow up and Amoeba's like, yo, this is a limited edition thing. We're going to price this at $100. We're going to make a bit of a profit here. So now they're going to make a, a $75 profit but I still make zero dollars on both of those sales. So when my fans sold it to Amoeba, I made nothing. When Amoeba sells my record, uh, resells the used vinyl copy, I made nothing. We can understand how this has gone on for the entire history of the music industry. Uh, used records, used CDs, even you know, used books, used whatever, and even paintings. Like David Hockney, one of my favorite uh, paintings. I have um, 
you know, a print up on my wall right now of the painting that just sold for $80 million. Uh, I paid $20 for the print. It's up on my wall. It's framed. Great value. The frame, I think, costs more. Right. <laughs> um, but David Hockney didn't make a dime from that $80 million sale, even though he's even still alive. And because artists don't make money off of their uh, when it gets resold. So what you're saying, though, because this is all in the digital space, everything can be tracked so I would in in that in that uh, vinyl use case scenario earlier, I would make if it's ten percent, I would make when my per, when the, my fan sold it to Amoeba for twenty five dollars, I would make two dollars. Yeah, exactly. I would make ten dollars theoretically. Is that is that correct? Exactly. Yeah. Every time it's resold and resold and resold, you make that ten percent, which is really interesting to think about because it also affects something. How much you should you originally sell for some, something if it has this resale right, right? Mm -hmm. Because effectively, you're now a business partner with the person who buys it. And that means also they don't get to sell it for as much. So does that mean you have to price it lower? Probably. Mm -hmm. And I think this is the thing that's really hard for especially fine artists and musicians who are used to selling their work for a certain high value price. Maybe you sell paintings for $25,000 or $100,000 and you're like, Joe, why? Well, why are you asking me to price it at a thousand dollars, five hundred dollars, two hundred dollars? I was like, well, mm -hmm. did you get a resale right with that? Because if you did, you would probably sell it for less for the first sale, even mm -hmm. if you were selling a physical piece. And they'd say, oh, wait a minute, there is a there's a cost to this privilege, and so that is something I think a lot of people are having to grapple with. And mm -hmm. I think you see some of the sales out there where the prices are very very high and they don't sell out is because they think that they can translate. There are apples to apples here when really it's apples to oranges and, you know, totally different things. Yeah. Well, in the music space, I think it goes the other way is um, in that we're used to making a third of a penny per stream from our music. And we're like, you know, thinking that we need millions of streams to make uh, thousands of dollars. Uh, as artists, and as you know firsthand, it is way, way less than that for songwriters. But um, when it comes to NFTs, we're seeing artists pricing their NFTs at $500 or $5,000. And, you know, in the fine art space, that's not a lot. But in the music space, that's insane for a song, theoretically, seemingly crazy for a song that you could just listen to for free. So, um, what are you, let me break down, um, to get uh, specific, I'm going to break it down here. Uh, one of the artists on crypto.com that have sold their NFTs, uh, Axel Mansour. And, uh, for those of you who don't know, he is the icon of clubhouse. Uh, he's the founder of lullaby club. I've performed oh, on nice. lullaby club a couple times and, and, uh, Axel quick shout out, uh, was, was one of my first consulting clients, like, no like kidding. eight years ago wow. when I first got Ari's take started, he like hit me up. He's like, Hey, love the blog. Do you, do you consult? I'm like, Oh my gosh. Uh, yeah. Why not? I do now. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know. So, you know, well, good. he's learned a lot. He's a friend of mine. I've known him for a couple of years now. And he, he's yeah. really shown probably taking some of your lessons. So, yeah, he's a great artist and really smart guy. Um, and so I, I'm just looking at some of his uh, drops that we have here. And he had one um, that was uh, a, 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 he put on a sale and it was uh, the iconic um, one. And, and it, he had 200 additions, I guess. And I think they went, they sold for $200 each and, you know, he made around $40,000 there. And, but then he also did a drop, uh, that was a, a, just an auction mm -hmm. sleepy boy, uh, one, which is just like this spinning, like that icon, his clubhouse headshot icon, uh, in a short little visualizer with some of his music below it. But that one went for over $6,000. Yeah. Um, First off, explain the difference between these multiple editions um, and I guess the the sale versus an auction and how that yeah. works. Of course. So, you know, lots of these platforms are doing different mechanics to sell NFTs. And so, mm -hmm. but what we're, we're, what our platform is doing right now is we offer, the, you can just do a straight up auction and you can set a reserve price, you know, how much money you want, or rather I should say, you can set what you want to start the auction at. So if you're like, I don't want to sell this unless it's a million dollars, you know, they'd have to put a million dollars on, but you could also put it for a dollar or a thousand dollars. And so that um, people could come in and they bid just like a traditional auction. There'll be a record of everyone who bid on it. Right. So it's really fun because you, you get the kind of 
uh, auction house vibe. You know, if everyone's raising their their little <laughs> thing, they can see who's who's bidding, and they can bid with um, the, with their cryptocurrency. So you need to bring your own wallet if you want to do that, because some of these bids get quite expensive, and so you can't really use a Visa, Mastercard, right? Mm. Um, one of uh, you know, so you can bring either Crypto.com wallet, which is a one of the biggest uh, crypto wallets. Crypto.com has got over 10 million users available in many, many countries. Mm-hmm. Um, and you could also bring other uh, third-party wallets like MetaMask, which is one mm-hmm. very big popular one, or a coin wallet. Um, and you, wherever you onboard your, your cryptocurrency originally, so meaning you bring fiat dollars like a debit card into there uh, you know, from your bank or ACH from your bank or something, depending on where you live, um, then you can send it to us through your wallet or through a, a kind of um, popular wallet. So that's the way you bid and uh, everyone can see your bids through user. It's not just your username, but you know, you can obviously make it your own. Um, and then whoever wins gets that thing. And typically we, most people pick about a, a day long auction, but um, we allow people to pick whatever they want right now. Our, our platform is invite only and quite exclusive at the moment. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, really focused on those superstar artists and really interesting projects. Like today we have yeah. a really interesting, um, indie, indie artist that has on their, I think their first big record and, um, but they have an incredible artist paired with them, visual artist, and they've done this just magical project where it all comes together. And mm-hmm. so they're doing a bunch of additions. So Emmett Finn is the name of the gentleman who's doing, who's a musician. Mm-hmm. Um, and he has uh, a bunch of different pieces. He has 10 different pieces mm-hmm. and each of them, you can only buy so many of them, right? So there's like one of 50, one of a hundred and, and different, you know, additions and they're priced differently. And okay. so they all correspond. This one in particular is really fun because if you collect them all, they become this one big sculpture, this digital sculpture. And there's like a really fun thing to, to move it around. And, um, it all, it all just looks fun and, and interesting. And so, um, once you've collected them all, he's going to give you a, I think a plus one at VIP at his, uh, concerts this year as well, if, huh. if it's his concert. And so that was a really interesting thing, but it's on its own. Cool. It's cool. I mean, I don't think he yeah. really had to do that, but it's an, it's definitely an extra perk for the fans that, uh, may not be like mega art fans, but they're mm-hmm. mega Emma Finn fans. And so they'll, they'll get it as well. And nice. so, so those additions, uh-huh. um, you can price however you want. We have some people who do mm-hmm. 25 of 25 at $200. We have other people, you know, we dropped with Snoop Dogg. He had a big addition. I'm not, I don't mm-hmm. suggest this for everyone, but he had 20,000 that you could buy. Um, and, uh, you know, these were about 500 bucks each. So but not everyone, those didn't sell out. And so after the sale is over, which we do these exclusive moments in time where we just drop usually about 24 to 40 hours, sometimes less, sometimes more, depending on what the artist wants to do. Mm-hmm. Um, after that, the remaining that did not get sold are destroyed forever. It's what's called burned. And so this creates a really fun dynamic where if they're gone, there's no more made, right? So then the secondary market that we talked about becomes really huh. exciting and people will want to come in and, and purchase those because they're just as rare as a limited trading card or a special action figure uh, mm-hmm. or something like that where there's a collectability and a rareness to them. Right, I, I saw the Snoop Dogg uh, diamond joint drop. I know he did a few 420 uh, drops and, and that makes a lot of sense that, that Snoop Dogg would be doing the 420 drops. Um, so when you're saying that the ones that didn't sell get burned uh let's just break down uh the mechanics and the technology behind this because we we actually I, I feel like we've gone almost a half hour in this conversation we haven't really mentioned the blockchain once um, Pro, so that I, means we're doing it right ari because <laughs> that's how this is supposed to work right this is right. art you don't have to understand the technology art yeah. should be like magic you know and a good yeah. technology <laughs> starts to feel like magic you don't need to know the, the nitty gritty, the ones and zeros of how it works. You need to know why it makes you feel something and get excited about it, right? But yes, yes there's of course some very complicated technology <laughs> uh, that's been built over the last decade around mm-hmm. uh, blockchain and cryptocurrencies that makes this very stable, secure, safe, and um, establishes these technological mechanisms that enable to show you pr- the provenance, right? And to show mm-hmm. that this transaction happened um, and everyone agrees, the computers mostly agree that this <laughs> transaction happened. Yes. And and so uh, the NFT, just so I understand this, 
you're not actually buying that little visualizer or Snoop Dogg um, yelling uh, D's nuts uh, to a little video, his voice yelling D's nuts, because uh, that is a, a <laughs> an NFT uh, sold on crypto.com I saw as well, which is great. Um, you're not actually buying that, because like you said, you could control click, download that, and have that live on your computer. What you're doing is you're buying the certificate of authenticity saying that you are the rightful owner of this. Is that correct? Pretty much. I mean, that's okay. the easiest way to, I think, to comprehend it. You know, what is really happening is you have a wallet and I have a wallet and I'm sending it from my wallet to your wallet. And there's a record that will be immutable in time. It would be really mm -hmm. hard to get rid of unless all the computers that are processing that specific blockchain go down mm -hmm. uh, or have some sort of, you know, big change or error or something. You know, there are mm -hmm. thousands of tens of thousands of computers that are making sure that that is a valid transaction that transaction happened and they will try to keep that transaction in the network stored forever the record mm -hmm. that that happened on a ledger essentially just like you know writing a, a, a like a bookkeeper would write in okay I, joe bought it already you know sold it mm -hmm. etc um mm -hmm. or the same way that a county or a city or a state might uh record a title transfer okay Ari owned this land and now Joe owns this land. And on this mm -hmm. date, it was sold. And, and that's in the record books, mm -hmm. right? And maybe they make a copy every year, every month, every day. But instead, this is forever recorded and computers verify that it happened all the time and make sure that no one is uh, saying that it was sold, even if it wasn't. Every, all the computers have to agree that that transaction happened. And there's passwords involved and you know, make sure everyone uh, is properly accounting for what happened. So there are a lot of uh, NFT marketplaces right now. Obviously, you're the global head of NFT at crypto.com. There's uh, probably one of the most popular ones right now is Nifty Gateway. There's Zora. There, I mean, there's so many right now that are just popping up every day. Uh, what happens if I sell my NFT on crypto.com and crypto.com, or let, may, let's not use crypto.com because I don't want you to, to think of worst case scenario here. Let's use a, you know, a, a nifty gateway or whatever. Well, real use case scenario, nifty gateway got hacked. So it's like, you can't hack the blockchain. You can't, I understand you can't like, I, I understand the technology with this ledger. It's like, you need, you know, you can't really hack this blockchain, the Ethereum blockchain where most NFTs are hosted and that, you know, there's this ledger that's immutable and that you, you know, is always there. Um, but like, what happens if the marketplace where my NFT more or less is stored and where I have all that information goes down or it gets hacked yeah, or dies? Or what let's talk now? about like, there's, there's different types of hacks, right? And, okay. and hacking, I think has become synonymous with, with theft and graft and, and, okay. you know, and I think there's, there's different types of hacks and level of severity of hacks. I think what, what happened to Nifty was. Uh, someone did what's called credential stuffing. So they took existing usernames on other websites and they used mm -hmm. where they think they use the same password and they attempted to access um, those things. That's like the, the digital equivalent of someone found your keys underneath your, your doormat and went mm -hmm. into your house, right? It wasn't that your lock was broken. It wasn't that someone broke a window. It's literally they found your key and put it right in. And that's kind okay. of on you for not keeping different passwords for every single thing. I don't blame Nifty for that hack, although they should have probably a more strict two-factor authentication in there. The right. same thing could happen with, you know, if I bought an NFT, even on a, on a um, non-custodial wallet, meaning one that I like have in my own uh, possession and, and is a, the most like... Um, technologically sophisticated way of owning uh, it's a really the most bare metal basic mm -hmm. way of owning owning cryptocurrency is to have your own wallet and to like literally type in the transaction through a, through a terminal or something versus mm -hmm. having a crypto.com which is a custodian and, and you know um, we store your thing for you right you don't mm -hmm. have to go and figure out how to the, the, you know make a fair amount of do amount of, a little bit of coding to figure it out right um, a lot of convenience in the same way that you don't have to, you know, have a banking license to have a bank. You just go to the bank and you become a customer of the bank. Um, so I, there are different levels of hacking. Ethereum, which is the one of the second most popular probably blockchain out there other than Bitcoin, um, mm -hmm. 
is uh, could be hacked. I mean, and that would be a catastrophic thing for the whole community, right? Sure. It's very unlikely that that would happen, right? It's been around for many years now. There's been a lot of people who tried to hack it, presumably. Uh, there are different known attacks. So you, you, there's a very uh, well-known attack called a 51%, meaning if they control 51% of all the computers that are verifying the transactions, mm. that could be a hack. It's really just like an invasion, essentially. Sure. Um, but it's not, uh, you know, you can imagine that some of the smartest security engineers have battle tested it. And so, yes, sure. something could go wrong in the same way that your bank could have a, a technological error or right. some sort of bad thing could happen. Um, and there would have to be some fixing that, right? And that's when the long arm of the, alarm, long arm of the law would probably step in. Um, so or for at least I, on the Ethereum side, the community yeah. would probably step in alongside the law, right? Sure. So, all right. So, so if I buy or sell something on crypto.com, can I take that NFT and then put it on OpenSea? So not right now. So, okay. you know, having with my background, you know, I <laughs> already knows more than many. I love royalties and making sure royalties are paid to the proper person. And right. so right now the standard setting in the uh, community isn't fully there yet, right? There are a number of standards that have been proposed um, they're not fully implemented by everyone yet. We want to make sure that, um, you know, when so, when we are ready to let people take things off of our platform, that their royalties will be paid and, and stay intact. So if they're sold, yes. you know, I don't want to have what's happened, what's called breaking the smart contract, right? So there's always smart right. contracts that um, make these royalties possible. If that smart contract is broken, you're not going to get your royalties. And so then you're left mm -hmm. to legally chase them down to try to get those royalties or help hope that they do it out of the goodness of their heart. But mm -hmm. um, for us, we want to make sure that that's done properly and mm -hmm. all the different platforms uh, and work with us in the same way. We want to be able to pay their customers royalties, right? right. And their original sales royalties. So we want to make sure that that is a, a you know, bi-directional and so that someone doesn't just doesn't take it off our platform, move mm -hmm. it somewhere else and then move it somewhere else and break it mm -hmm. that way. So we want to make sure everyone is on the same page and mm -hmm. implementing, um, you know, some safety nets around this because, um, this is one of the things I think is most exciting about this world is this this resale right. So for for now, mm -hmm. we are um, we're taking that we're doing that, and then we'll eventually we'll as the community gets there, we'll make um, you know agreements and implement software that will help make sure all the best people are going to do that. Okay, so that makes sense. Um, so for uh, right now, with with um, how it works. Um, you, you mentioned kind of you know, the integrity and speaking of royalties or fees or any of that stuff, how does crypto.com work in terms of like, how are you making, how is crypto.com making their money? Do you, do you take a percentage off the top? Do you charge fee minting fees or do you charge fees for putting something up on crypto.com or how, do, what's the business model here? Yeah. So right now we're an exclusive platform. We're really, I, you know, my team and I are selecting things that we think will really work well. And we're really focusing on doing uh, drops, meaning like once a day, we're putting things out and these are what's up for sale. Uh -huh. And sometimes we do two in a day, but really mostly just do one at a time. And um, for now, that's the way we're working. We, we, we're negotiating every deal uh, and, you know, with each creator and depending on what they have going on and, um, you know, it, it. it varies, but it, you know, tend to be at the more premium side of the market because we're mm -hmm. doing a lot of marketing for our drops. So, sure. um, we're spending substantially in terms of, uh, paid marketing mm -hmm. and, um, you know, making sure we get the word out because right now, most of the buyers are not going to be fans. That's going right. to come in the next few years, but today, especially for your first drop, most of them are going to be people who are already collecting things. They think it's interesting, may have heard of your band, maybe they heard of your artistry, but mm -hmm. they're probably doing a little speculation or maybe they're just taking a bet. And then you'll get some fans buying, but those are really, there's going to be the existing crypto head that are your fans, right? Mm -hmm. um, the nice thing about our platform is we do accept Visa or MasterCard, so we can convert those kind of crypto curious fans over. Gotcha. What we're seeing though is, you know, I, I yeah, that's what we call them. <laughs> crypto curious, I love and, it. And okay. we have a lot of those people at crypto.com, right? It's very simple uh -huh. to remember our our brand. And so, yeah, it's like, oh, well, that seems legit, right? Yeah. Um, and we, I can attest we are. And um, so for, for us, it's, you know, we think the next 100 million plus people who get into crypto are going to get into it through NFTs. They're not even going to know what, they don't even need to know what Bitcoin is. They just need to know, 
I like this. I yeah. like F1, Aston Martin, who we did a drop with. You know, mm-hmm, people mm-hmm. are buying these Top Shot, uh, which is another big NFT uh, with with NBA. It's a, their mm-hmm. pictures and videos of NBA moments in the in the basketball league. And um, right, like when LeBron, you know, those are traded. Same kind of mechanics. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And so, a lot of those people didn't even know what nfts were they didn't have to they didn't even have right. to know what cryptocurrencies were or a blockchain yeah. they just knew this was this interesting digital collectible and um this you know nba sanctioned it so it seems legit and so that's good you see that more and more as people get mm-hmm. their fans converted over especially you're not going to do you know i would recommend most people don't go for a huge 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 first drop right go for something very simple Mm-hmm. Go for something that's affordable to your fans. Give something back to your fans. Give something to the collectors so that um, the super fans can come in later and buy it, right? As you've done more. But at least start warming your fans up to that this is a way you're going to be showing off your artistry and you're going to be creating things going forward. And I wouldn't just show up for one one time. People mm-hmm. smell that in the community right now and they're just saying, this is a cash grab. This is not interesting. And mm-hmm. don't bother doing it if it's not interesting, right? And so there's a lot of people... Um, creating really amazing art right now. There's a lot of people doing some so-so art, unfortunately. Well, that's a really good point because I think a lot of artists are listening to this right now and they're, and they're also hearing the large numbers that everyone has done. I mean, you know, it's not just like what Snoop Dogg did and it's not just, you know, uh, what Grimes did at at the multi-millions or, or even Blau, who wasn't a household name, isn't a household name other since his like $11 million NFT drop. But, you know, I, I, I've been seeing... Um, I mean, there's artists, large and small, doing NFTs that are making significant money. So a lot of artists are like, man, I should do an NFT drop. But it's, it's one, very complicated. Uh, I was watching a bunch mm-hmm. of YouTube tutorials on, on even how to like put up my own NFT if I wanted to on like OpenSea or something that was not exclusive, like crypto.com. I can't, I understand no one can go to right now unless they're invited. Same with Nifty Gateway, some of these other platforms, but like, OpenSea or Zora or something like that, you can pop up an NFT tonight if you want, but it's not only extremely complicated to do. Now, I, I'm going to get pushback from crypto heads, but let me tell you, it's complicated. I, like, it, it's complicated. And expensive. <laughs> and expensive. That's the other yeah. thing. It's like hundreds of dollars to mint and go through the whole process. So like, yeah, you could theoretically lose a lot of money and time doing this. Yeah. And if you're not- I think that's creating- the biggest thing is time. Yes. Yes. And and I think a lot of, you know, I've, I've spent 10 years in the independent music community. I bought companies like CD Baby. I helped Song Trust from the very beginning of mm-hmm. the founders. I spent a lot of time with independent musicians. And for most people, this will not be, in the independent community, a great use of their time. Right. Just full stop. I want, I want to, and I don't want to, I want to, I don't want to scare people away too much, but really, mm-hmm. this is a very early thing. There are plenty of other ways to get the word out as an independent musician. And there are plenty of things to focus on, you know, Mm -hmm. getting everything else right, getting the fundamentals right. Now, if you happen to have a best friend who's an amazing 3D, you know, VFX artist, and you can Mm -hmm. collaborate and they already have a community, okay, that's great. In the same way that having a friend who's a promoter or a booker at a, you know, local bar and book, you know, having that connect, sure, if you have that cheat code, Mm. Great. That's that's something you should absolutely lean in, lean in on. If you're not that person, there's probably other things to focus on in your career as sure. an early stage musician. And you shouldn't be spending money trying to go after this unless it's something that you really are passionate about, want to spend the time, significant amounts of time to learn about. And mm-hmm. it may not be the most way, easiest way to be successful at, in your career. And that's a that's great a point. And I'm, I'm really happy that you mentioned that and brought that up because that's a very important disclaimer that not enough people are mentioning right now to the music community and the art community in general. Um, and, you know, we are a year or two at least away from like mass consumer uh, market plays with, with NFTs. If you, right? say, if you say what's an NFT to someone in the, in the street in New York City, they say Subway's over there. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they're not going to... They're not going right. to know what it is. So right. Right. They, right. SNL did it. Sure, they talked yeah. about it, yeah. but that went right yeah. over everyone's head. And right. I mean, they were talking so fast that you didn't even <laughs> really understand. Yeah, so, exactly. you know, we are, yeah, we are very early from fan adoption. We're early, very early from where indie musicians can get real value out of it. Unless, sure. again, you have that cheat code. You have, you're super into it. You have a friend that's, you know, doing the the actual art for you. Mm-hmm. Um you know, and, and, and I think this is the other secret that people don't understand is folks like Don Diablo, folks like Grimes, those projects 
they were already in the works for a really long time. Those are not simple projects. They were bound for probably for museums and for mm. galleries, right? Wow. And they happened to find a way to really make them an interesting NFT with a lot more work. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it wasn't just, oh, we, I just translated it one to one. No, no, there's a whole lot of other things that go along with that. And I will also add a lot of these big numbers you're seeing, yep. they're pre-sold. This is just like a gallery, right? They'll, mm. they'll talk to the artists, see what they have, go look in their, in their um, studio, right? All the, the works they have. And they say, oh, I know someone who might buy that one. They'll go call them and say, hey, mm. do you like, I have this thing. Do you like this thing? And they'll pre-sell it. So all these numbers, a lot of these are pre-sold. You know, mm. they've already got a buyer spec. And maybe someone will come out of the woodwork and start a bidding war, right? And hopefully sure. that's what the gallerist really wants, right? They want to see, oh, wow, okay, some that they didn't even know came out of the woodwork to do this. But most of these are, you know, already had these kind of pre-agreed prices. Um, yeah, I mean, Verite uh, admitted on the show uh, that her friend bought her and one of her nfts which is of the first song ever and she's like yeah my friend purchased it for fifteen thousand dollars or whatever so my, it's like my friend the billionaire over here you know right i mean it's... she was very yeah transparent about that um that makes a lot of sense now i have to um bring up the environmental factor because when in the artist community especially uh, this is being talked about a lot. Yeah. Now, uh, most NFTs, I think all at this point, if I'm understanding this right, are hosted on the Ethereum blockchain. No. Not correct. Okay, no. so explain. Uh, well, hold, once, so let me just set up what the, the yeah. conflict is and then we're going to get to the solution because I did see that there was an environmental friendly NFT drop on crypto.com by my friend uh, Janelle Kroll uh, with a collaboration with David Aru. But um, so the Ethereum blockchain is very um, energy inefficient. It's very energy hungry. They they operate on this proof of work uh, system, Correct. which requires all these thousands of computers to uh, solve complex code. Uh, to, to it's a security measure to make sure that no one can like break it or or you know keep it secure and keep the ledger going. But it, it is it is inefficient by design. Uh, but the thing is, is like you know people are are choosing not to run NFTs because they're saying uh, the amount of energy it would cost to put up this NFT and mint this NFT and sell this NFT is the amount of energy that it would cost to power my recording studio for two years. And like if, crazy- Yeah, it is quite energy intensive. So a couple things have happened yes. with that, Tell right? Yes. So uh, tomorrow we're doing one with or for Earth Day. We'll be donating some of the proceeds uh, to uh -huh. various- um, environmental uh, causes. Mm -hmm. I'm really excited about this project. Beautiful piece of art uh, as a music video, and then they've added on more things uh, that people can collect. Um, our chain is our own chain. So it's, a, well, it's, it's not actually even our own anymore. It's the crypto.org chain. So it is a decentralized uh, chain um, that's built on a very common blockchain um, like infrastructure called Cosmos. And it's like, if you added up all the other Cosmos chains, it would probably be the third biggest blockchain, right? Under Ethereum. Hmm. Um, it's very cheap to transact. We are under what's called proof of stake, which is the, the alternative to proof of work. So it means um, instead of the computers attempting to um, mine or, or basically attempt to verify transactions through cryptography, people are instead bringing their proof of uh, stakes. They have to have a certain part, number of our own part of their own tokens and that provides them you know different ways to um, verify things and so mm -hmm. there's different incentives to make sure transactions are uh, properly vetted uh, mm -hmm. and are uh, you know sent through the the whole ecosystem with a lot less energy um, so so that there's that there was recently a um, very large auction uh, by people and people donated the entire proceeds of that uh, it was, I think it was about 6.5 million or maybe six point something million. Mm. Um, that auction alone, uh, donated it to all the money to, uh, so to carbon offsets. And that one auction alone has, uh, offset at that time. I assume it's still the case, all NFTs that have ever been made mm. and then some, so they've actually made the whole NFT industry carbon, uh, negative. So. You know, the challenge with the environment and cryptocurrency is a cryptocurrency problem. I would say it's not an NFT problem. Um, so, it's, so are 
all your NFTs on the Cosmos blockchain, not the Ethereum? It's so technically on the crypto.org chain. Crypto.org yes. chain. Okay. Yeah, so we don't own it. Crypto.com is a separate now separate organization. Um, huh. And that is a decentralized organization. I mean, you can be part member of that organization and, and help stake that coin and verify transactions for various benefits. Um, and, you know, you can then sell those tokens if you wanted to. Um, mm -hmm. But that's about a $6 billion market cap for our coin, I believe, depending on the price of our, our token. And it's a very popular tr token. So, you know, uh, tens of thousands of transactions can go through it based on what we're doing. And so over time, it won't just be us holding the, the tokens. It will be, it already is, many, many, many other people, companies, organizations, individuals. Um, and that will keep it uh, decentralized, meaning mm. not one company owns it, not one person owns it. It is many, many people own it. And that's, why, mm -hmm. that's the way we keep it safe and secure and so that it will never go down in time mm -hmm. right so there are other people so god forbid something bad happened to crypto.com crypto org would persist your nfts would persist as long as there are people still working on that chain got it oh well that's great to hear so um i because these nfts are hosted on the crypto.org a blockchain um and uh, is it going to present challenges in the future of of reselling nfts uh, on so, like, ethereum or something or yeah so the nice thing about this cosmos ecosystem it it really does mirror a lot of what's in the ethereum ecosystem mm -hmm. and so we have a lot of interoperability between them um particularly what's called erc20 which is a big protocol between uh, ethereum protocol and that makes it really easy for interoperability so sorry to get in the nerdy stuff here with all the numbers and the things but <laughs> uh, basically the the shorter answer is uh, this ecosystem is a very interoperable one and one that has been known to play well with others on in plenty of other mediums other than just NFTs, right? Blockchains gotcha. have lots of different applications and there's already mm -hmm. a lot of, you know, cooperation and interoperability between uh, between chains and mm -hmm. crypto.org is, a, is a quite a big one in the context of all the chains out there. I mean, well, that's great because that honestly has been the major, biggest, uh, I guess, pushback right now is the environmental um it is just how environmentally inefficient Ethereum is and just how detrimental it is to the environment right now. Even, I mean, there's controversy around carbon offsets and that's a whole other topic that we can get into and how effective carbon offsets actually are and what that actually means and on and on and on. Well, I've been down that rabbit hole. I'm not going to go down it right now, but I, I, I applaud people for, for those steps because we all um, you know, you know, people made headlines and got a lot of people into the NFT world once his digital painting or digital art, whatever you want to call it, sold for $69 at the Christie's auction. And, and then everyone's like, what's an NFT? And then everybody jumped in. He's like, he's probably dealing with an existential crisis. It's like, wow, I just helped destroy the environment. I just carved like 10 years off the Earth's lifespan. Now, I, so <laughs> the nice thing about that was one transaction for $69 million. So, you know, it wasn't a huge, but it was huge popular. Deal. He made it, it made all the headlines. Certainly which popularized then got a lot movement, yeah. of people to jump into NFTs who normally sure. wouldn't have. So that, you know, put a lot more strain on the Ethereum blockchain, which required more computing power on and on and on down the hole. And that's why, you know, but I get it. That's another topic. Either way, very great to hear that, that crypto.com is working on a proof of stake blockchain crypto.org i didn't know this and there's some misinformation flying around which i'm going to tell my friend sherry hugh, hugh who runs uh water and music uh she's got this ongoing air table of like all at music nfts and social tokens and it's just this database and it's this brilliant thing that i'm referencing all the time but it's she put there that all crypto.com nfts are on the ethereum blockchain and i have to go tell her that that is incorrect and we yeah, you, you can pay with ethereum all right. So there, if you are someone who's buying an NFT from us, you can pay with Ethereum. That would be not the best thing for the environment, obviously. Right. But you could also pay with fiat. You could pay with a stable coin. You could pay with crypto.com coin. Or your um, credit card, you said, right? You could pay with your coin? credit card or your, your okay. you know, Visa MasterCard right now. Visa MasterCard. Uh, okay. Yeah. All right. Well, that's great. And that, that's... Um, that's... That makes a lot of sense. And that that's really great to hear. And, and hopefully a lot more uh, marketplaces will either jump onto the crypto.org blockchain and use, a, or, or a blockchain that uses proof of stake that, do, that isn't so uh, environmentally taxing. 
Um, or the Ethereum blockchain will move from a proof of work to a proof of stake. They, yep. from what I've read, could literally do this overnight with a flip of a switch. Yep. And uh, then they're, they're, um, there's still they, challenges here. I mean, don't get me wrong. Look, this is a general crypto problem and sure. crypto could be more environmentally friendly. Sure. Uh, sure. There's a lot of things that could be more environmentally friendly, but there's a lot of um, challenges that uh, are very positive for society that, that uh, the blockchain helps. So, I, you know, this is one of them. I think we will get mm -hmm. through a lot of these uh, existing challenges, but um I think the the greater good of society will help with with this, and you know you could mine um, with renewable resources, right? We and you're actually seeing some of the biggest <laughs> sure. miners are hydropower in China. And, wow, you know, a lot of those dams are being used to power, and same thing in the northwest of America. There's mm -hmm. a lot of mining that's happening around renewables. Obviously, nice. there's a lot of um, rare, rare minerals used to to buy CPUs, and but these, that's a you know that's a challenge in the computing industry right so right. these are not just crypto problems it's just one of the applications i'm sorry i should say there are many problems with with um climate change in general and we have a lot of work to do as a society but um i'm yeah. hoping that uh we can get we can get there awesome um well this has been so illuminating so helpful um i i i think you really cracked this open um and this is the first time in in my uh months long research into nfts where i have heard uh a viable immediate solution to the environmental crisis that nfts are uh uh this is like it has been very encouraging to hear that uh, from the get-go, Crypto.com has chosen a blockchain network that is much more environmentally friendly today than what most of the other NFTs are on. So that that's awesome. Um, I encourage everybody to check out Crypto.com and just browse the marketplace. There's some really cool NFTs. We didn't get to cover all the ones today that are happening there, um, but really cool stuff that you guys are doing. Um, Joe, I really appreciate you coming on the show and explaining this and breaking this down. Really exciting stuff ahead. I can't wait to see your journey and where you go from here. There's one final question that I ask everybody who comes on the show. What does it mean to you to make it in the new music business? Mm, that's a great question. I think there's never been a time when um, more and more people can get in. And um, the music business has never had a more diffuse wall right so i think it really to me i mean, to be able to make a living would be amazing but even just the fact that you can you can get in now you know even i when i was growing up and i'm not that old but you know you had to know someone who knew someone who knew someone <laughs> and they had to be in a big glass tower and they had to give their approval and now it's click here on cd baby join song trust fill out a form right. here and you can if people like your stuff and you get enough marketing Obviously, the marketing's become the big challenge, but if you can make it, you can make fans, you can succeed, and I think that's really cool. And I, you know, mm -hmm. I'd like to think I played a small part in that uh, in my journey mm -hmm. of the last decade in the space, and I, I hope the next decade is going to be a lot easier, a lot brighter for people, mm -hmm. um, not without its challenges, but um, you know, to make it in the music business to me has never been easier, which is also I feel really good about um, about that, you know, and. and mm -hmm. In some ways, um, at least you don't sit on the sidelines and feel like you couldn't break in. At least you, you know, you had your, you have a shot now, right? Yes. You used to have yes. to really, you know, you couldn't, you could go to your local record store, but you weren't going to get Tower Records to distribute you, right? Right. right. And right. even, even in the beginning, you know, in the beginning, of iTunes, you had to be assigned to a major label, and then mm -hmm. CD Baby changed that, right? Steve Jobs called up the CEO, of, the founder of CD Baby, Derek and Sivers. they changed that. Yep. And now, more and more, these these walls are falling down. New walls are coming up, right, with playlists and other things. Mm -hmm. um, but there are um, there are more ways to succeed, and NFTs are going to be one of those things. Right. Yes. And this is going to be a way for some artists to trailblaze and storytell in new ways and really just blow people out of the water. Yes. Um, with their creativity. And so to make in the music business today is is just that is being a chance to have a, a way to show your creativity and do cool mm -hmm. things. And Absolutely. I as a big fan of of many musicians get to benefit from that. Totally. 
Well, Joe Conyers, thank you so much for uh, the the discussion today and all that you have done in the new music business. Uh, you know, I, there are tens of thousands, millions of artists who are appreciative of what you did with Song Trust and and help make the royalties more transparent and accessible to independent. That means a lot, Ari. Uh, yeah, I appreciate that. My, Absolutely. Myself included. I am a song trust songwriter. And, and, you know, I, I, so I appreciate the royalties that I have um, earned from and that you have helped track down for me uh, as well as so many other artists and, and song trust is still something that I refer to so many art songwriters as to how to get the royalties. So I very appreciate all of your work. You are a trailblazer in the new music business and uh, we are fortunate to have you a part of it. So thank you so much. Pleasure. Thanks again for having me. Absolutely. Thank you.